Well, today we're returning to our study in the Epistle of James. It's been a few weeks since we taught from that. So uh, perhaps a brief review will just kind of reorient us quickly to the things of James. James, as you recall, was writing to the Jewish converts to Christianity that were dispersed throughout the Roman Empire. He would have hoped to win some of his countrymen with this letter, but his primary concern was for these ethnically Jewish believers new in their faith in Christ. And false teachings, along with the Judaizers, false teachings had arisen within the Jewish communities. The Ebionites were among the chief offenders, promoting the idea that Paul the Apostle was a false apostle and that he should not be listened to. Second century early church father Irenaeus said this, that the Ebionites used only the Gospel of Matthew. They excluded the others. They venerated Jerusalem, seeing itself as a center of worship, something of mysticism, and they denied Jesus' divine conception. They believed only in a natural birth and conception. Now recall, Paul warned us similarly about Judaizers and other false teachers in his letters. If you'll remember from Galatians 1, 8, and 9, he's very strong in his language. He said, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. That's not, that's not easy language here. And then he says it again, as we have said before, so I say now again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. You know, just down the street, just a couple blocks, maybe one block down on the left, is another gospel being taught today. It's a false gospel. It's a gospel that is dead. It's not found to be in Christ. And yet they'll use Christian language. In a similar manner, James was warning the believers about a time of testing that would be coming to them, that they were to remain faithful to Christ, the Christ that had been preached to them, and not as these false teachers were promoting. Where a man or woman lacked wisdom, they were to seek God and to ask wisdom, and God would give them this wisdom generously. And we carried them through their various trials and temptations. And as they endured, it was said that a steadfastness of faith would be developed in them. God would strengthen their faith. James encourages readers. He said, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And it turns out if you're quick to speak, you're often quick to anger. Our brother then took the idea of being a hearer, and he said not only to be a good hearer of the word, then he introduces the idea of being a doer of the word. And we're in that line of reasoning right now. That's where we're at. James began to teach us how we could be a doer. He said, first, put away the unbridled tongue. He said, if you say you're a person of faith and have an unbridled tongue, your religion is worthless. In verse 27 of chapter 1, he then goes and says, let me show you what a pure and undefiled religion looks like. What doers of the word would look like. Visit the orphans and the widows and their affliction. There's some kind of doing associated Orphans and widows keeping oneself self unstained from the world. And then Gary preached our last sermon on James and he taught us from chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. About the sin of showing partiality, whereby people tend to look down on others for various reasons or say, hey, there's a rich guy, give him the better seat. Or someone who's with piety looks down on the obvious sinner over there, all the meanwhile practicing his own sin secretly. He said, put all that away. And be a doer of the word. Cast aside all these things. It's not for the body of Christ. I think we've done that as a church. I hope we continue. That everybody that walks in these doors has a seat. Literally at our table. Yeah. yeah. And today's passage is found in James 2, 14 to 26. We see James continue the idea of being a doer of the word. If you'll turn there, please. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and be filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? 
Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Let's pray, church. Our great Father in heaven, I pray that this word is a challenging to us, exhorting us to action. It's not for the other person, Lord, and I pray that this would be so among us. As I've seen it so many times, let it never depart from these doors, Father. This gathering. May, may doing good forever be uh, on our tongues. I pray, Father, for this message that uh, Christ would be centered in it all. That as the cares of this world surely are there, even in the moment I think of my dear Donna not feeling well today, God, I just, uh, for a moment in time, turn our affections to you. Seeking you again, O Lord, knowing and believing that the Holy Spirit will guide and lead us again to the revelations of Christ to reveal the Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, today's sermon is, is appropriately entitled, Faith Without Works, Dead, Useless, Dead. When you see those words in your Bibles, if you write in your Bibles, underline them. Faith Without Works, Dead, Useless, Dead. That's, that's where James is going with this when you say faith without works. Of course, James loved the church and he was loving Jewish converts to Christianity. And so he wrote quite pointedly, defensively, and in the negative what a false faith is looking like. And as we consider James's teaching, we must notice that he put forward a rhetorical question regarding the nature of a genuine saving faith and its relationship to works. Our task then is to consider what is this genuine saving faith then supposed to look like? We'll do that. Secondly, we must consider what a false or even an evil faith might look like. And finally, we'll look at examples of a living faith through the characters of Abraham and Rahab. Let's take a look at this. A saving faith in Christ. To teach us what a genuine and saving faith looks like, James asked the Jewish readers to consider his question. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? And James answered that in verse 17 by calling it dead. So I think we would have to conclude no. The answer is absolutely no. That kind of faith cannot be a saving faith. It's a dead faith. To answer the question more fully, we should consider the object of our faith faith. Now most of us are familiar with the infamous trust fall. That's where you, you stand in front of your buddy. It's a little faith building exercise. You got two people and, and one stands and they face the same way and the guy in front crosses his arms, falls back and his buddy's supposed to catch him. You ever done that before? Have you ever had someone not catch you? All right. I'd be the guy that didn't catch you in my teenage years. Now uh, all these wise years later I'd probably catch you. Okay. Anyone want to try right now? Any volunteers? Okay, good. So the idea is faith, a little bit of trust being instilled. No takers. Okay, good. Let, let me tell you that I, well, I don't think I'd let anybody fall today. Faith is only as good as the person and the character of the person that it's placed in. That's it. Therefore, a saving faith, a faith that has a genuinely saved the soul of a lost sinner. It can only occur if a person has been saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And, and Jesus said in John 14, 6, he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You know this verse so well. No one comes to the Father except through me. And to have a genuine and saving faith requires that Jesus save the person. 
And while it might sound simplistic, even rudimentary, that we assume maybe it doesn't need to be said anymore, it's, that's not the case. It needs to be said. A tender moment with my sweetie last night. She, was, she had a really good day, but at night she was confused. And uh, she said, I'm worried about you. I said, what's wrong? She said, are you saved? And I said, well, uh, why do you ask that, honey? She said, I want to know. My mom didn't think you were saved. <laughs> I said, well, I'm going to talk to your mama. And uh, mom's been deceased 10 years now, you know. And I said, well, honey, I know this. I trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his works for my salvation, for my redemption. And I said, are you saved, sweetie? She said, I am. I said, why? She said, I trust in Jesus. You see, you'd think we wouldn't need to hear this, right? But even in the most tender moments, we need to be reminded of this again and again. We live in a time and culture that experiences, by the way, the same sins of, of ancient cultures over and over again. They just kind of repeat themselves and present themselves differently in our time. People want to believe in a divine heaven or a benevolent God, but not so much Jesus today. There's not a lot of honor in the culture for Jesus. They, they want all that, all of heaven, just not Jesus. Muslims will say Jesus is a good prophet. They'll say, but you can leave that whole being part of the Son of God and Him being part of God out of it. Here's what they say about all Christians, literally. And I'm not trying to impugn Muslims. This is just a foundational teaching. If you say that Jesus has any part of God, you've committed the unpardonable sin of shirk, you're an idolater, and you're worthy of death for having said that. The problem is Jesus said that. Jesus said, I and the Father are one in John 10.30. And the whole opening of John's Gospel, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The whole Gospel testifies about Him. And so it's easy to point to the Muslims and see them going astray with Christ here. But a popular view today... If we're to get into the culture, is the person who's invented the little g-god, the god of their own doing, who's kind of Christian-like, kind of Bible-like, but really mostly just an invented god of the mind. This is the god of the age. Idolatry. A god that serves our will. Me and God got a special arrangement. One of my favorites. Ah. God's looking out for me. I'm good. If you ask people the great question, if you died today, why should God let you into heaven? You'd be surprised at how many people will point to their works, but never mention Jesus Christ. I spent an hour with a guy one day. He went on and on about all his works and never could utter the name of Jesus after having been in church for five years. Maybe they did spend their lifetime helping people. There are people like this. You may know people like this. They're, they're, event, they're like, hey, community event organizers, and we're going to do good, and we're going to help people. We're going to do lunches. We're going to do send packs over here. Christians do this, by the way. There's just a different motive. And some people can spend their entire lives doing this. And somewhere out there, what they're really hoping to do is atone for their sins through their works, just apart from Jesus dead they're destined for hell apart from Christ this is what James is getting at in 14 to 17 what good is it my brothers when, if you have faith but don't have works can a faith save them if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in food and one of you says go in peace be warm and filled and you don't provide the needs for the body what good is that it's dead if we take the thought as a whole, and we should, we'll see that a saving faith then must rest in Christ's work. This is where it begins. Our work and our saving faith will lead us to works. But it must be based in Jesus Christ. This is my first sub-point to you, that a saving faith rests in the work of Christ for our salvation. If we're truly saved by Christ's work, we're going to live our lives in service to Christ and His ongoing work that He has given to the church. 
Therefore, a person who spends their life literally serving other people and does so apart from Christ has really only gained the trophies on their wall and their certificates of appreciation. That's it. In the end, it'll perish in the fire. It'll, it'll be burned up. It's, it's worthless. Jesus taught something that's very appropriately connected to James. Chapter 22, Matthew 22. In it, verses 34 to 40. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him the question to test him. Teacher, what is the great commandment of the law? And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the, and the prophets. Now, a genuine faith in God is going to cause us to love our neighbors. The work upon the cross was the work of great sacrifice and love. And I think that this is at the very core of what James is teaching us here in the motives of his writing to these Jewish converts. Jesus commanded, we love God and love our neighbors as ourselves. Would, would you let yourself go freezing cold outside in the winter with your coat hanging on a rack? Would you let your children freeze while you wore a coat and they didn't? Would you let your neighbor freeze as you sat there warm and did not render aid? Would you do that? Of course we wouldn't do that. James begins to answer that if your brother or sister is poorly clothed. Don't just bless them with name. Put a coat on them. Fill their bellies. This is what they need. It is of no good for anyone involved to take this action that James is describing for us here. When, when, when religious people do this, what they do is the hungry person who is cold continues being hungry and cold. And the religious person who is of a fake religion, a worthless religion, continues on in their fake and worthless religion. His love took it to the cross. And I ask you then, is it too much then to expect that a people who are created anew in Jesus Christ would love others selflessly as Christ loves? We're to love in that manner. Look at Matthew 25 for a minute. We're going to be in verse 31. This is the Olivet Discourse. These are the final teachings of Jesus he gave before Passion Week and his death and burial. Verse 31, and he begins to teach about the final judgment. Listen to this narrative of Christ. It is both a blessing and a curse. A blessing and a curse. A blessing to those who believe and obey. These are the sheep. And a curse to those who do not believe or those who say they believe but have no obedience to Christ, no, no outflow of works from Him. The goats, in verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, you can imagine the scene, and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will place the sheep on His right, and the goats on his left, sorry if you're on the left today. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you before or from the foundation of the world. Listen to this. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you? Or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of my brothers, you did it to me. Jesus. 
Jesus is very concerned about how we treat others in this world. Very concerned, especially for our brothers and sisters of the faith. But uh, and he doesn't make it exclusive, but especially those who are of our faith. He then turned his attention to the goats. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me. You cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. They will also answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, stranger, naked, sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will say to them, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. James has this in his mind when he's writing to these brothers and sisters who are believers. Now notice that James in his passage, he makes it even closer. He said, these are your brothers and your sisters. And in what sense might he be thinking that? Perhaps in a Jewish context, a Jewish convert context. Maybe Judaism, his countrymen even in wider. But I don't think that James means to, means to exclude everybody. as though, well, Jews can only help Jews. You know, and uh, Gentile Christians can help Gentiles. No, that's, that's not where James is going with this. He's speaking to a group of people. But this is universally true in the church. We don't step over our brothers and sisters in Christ. No limitations there. The great idea at hand is the need of the needy. Would we step over the poor and destitute? Bless them with some sense of piety as we, bless you my brothers and sisters. May, may your hunger be filled. <laughs> of course we wouldn't do that. What good is that, asked James. No earthly value and to a heavenly demise. James called such a faith dead, according to verse 17. To be dead is to have no life in it. In other words, Christ is not in it. And if Christ is not in it, it is a dead thing. It is bankrupt. It is worthless. Or as James says, dead, useless, and dead. No matter how upset folks might be if we go there with them and whatnot, we need to point it out that falsely religious folks... That a saving faith is centered upon Christ and his redemptive work and his love. And all who are genuinely saved unto Christ will walk in good works. And that's my second subpoint, 1B, I guess. A saving faith is accompanied by good works. This is what James is getting at. I would direct your attention to Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now notice that Paul makes quite an assumption there. For all genuine believers, for we are his. We are his workmanship. We are his. No longer unto ourselves, we are his. The reason that we are walking good works is primarily because we are his. And we've been created anew in Christ. And we learned that God is established for anyone created new in Christ. That he's already prepared beforehand works that we ought to walk in. And so we walk in them. You show me a professed man or woman who has no works and I'll show you a fraud, a fake, a poser. Such a person has not the love of Christ in them at all. James is making this case. So he continues in verse 18 with a strange saying. He said, but someone will say, you have faith. I have works. James says, you show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Imagine the scene played out in the modern era. You tell a person, you're, you're telling him, calling him to believe upon Christ. He says, ah, that faith stuff's for you. That's for you. Let that, I'm not about that, you know. No, thank you. I'll let it all work out in the end. I'm doing things. God's got my back. He'll figure it out in the end. What is that person hoping for? That the great balancing scales, more sin, 
or more good works, that somehow it'll balance over to the good works side and that God will somehow let them on their merit into heaven. That's how it looks in the modern era. I'm trusting in my works. Faith without works is dead. Guess what? Works without faith is dead. It's just as dead. It's only faith accompanied by God or good works that James says so proves the faith in Christ that that actually exists in a person. James concluded, show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Now, not everybody who claims Christ has a genuine faith in Christ. We know this. Many have a false faith. And if you will, some even have an evil faith. This is what a false faith looks like. This is our second main point. We'll be here just very briefly. False faith is any faith that's not centered upon Jesus Christ. It may include His name or some aspects, some thing about God. They may know God is love. But it's not a saving faith because Christ is not in it. And therefore, whether one has works or not, it matters not because the faith is misplaced. It's placed in the wrong person. This is somebody who is more trusting in their imagined God or their own view of themselves in light of works. James says this is a demonic faith at times. James 2.19, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. The doctrine of demons, it deals in these half-truths. They kind of get, quote, scripture, right? Have you seen people like this? They'll take the word of God and just somewhere subtly, they'll just twist one little thing. Let me give you an example. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Let me just twist that a little bit. Add an indefinite article. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. That is a doctrine of the demons right there. Just a little twisting of truth. Where did that begin? It began in a man, Charles Taze Russell, who couldn't conceive that God would send anybody to hell. And a century and a half later, here we are with the Jehovah's Witness false teachings of a demonic doctrine that Jesus has created lesser. Have truth. The most abused scripture, of course, comes from 1 John 4, 8. God is love. And so the perverted mind of the people today, they'll say, well, God will bless anything I perceive of is love. God will say that's blessed. And then they'll say, hey, and by the way, would you all mind just drinking this cup from the demons right here with me? Can you drink this in? Affirm this as good. They hand you the cup. And you got a choice. Drink. Participate. Slap that cup away and go, no, let me tell you the truth. You know, I would go for that one. Or maybe gently, gently rebuke, right? Tell them the truth of God's word. No, I'm not going to drink that poison from you. You demon, you devil. The demons believe in God. But at least they had the sense to shudder. Jeremiah 6.15, we hear a pronouncement of God upon a wayward people. Jeremiah 6, and then we're going to go to 7 for a second. Jeremiah 6.15 a wayward and wicked Hebrew people. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they weren't ashamed at all. You've heard this before. They didn't even know how to blush. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall. And at the time I punish them, they shall be overthrown. This is so much like today. People don't even know that they should blush. They don't know. It never enters their mind. But later in 7, verses 16 to 18... This is hard to reconcile to God, but listen to what he's telling the prophet. As for you, prophet, do not pray for these people or lift up a cry or prayer for them. Do not intercede with me. I will not hear you. Do you not see what they are doing in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, the fathers kindle fire, the women knead dough. Make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger. They surely were provoking God on Tuesday this week. Normally at the 
public ministry we share in the, the abortion mill ministry I was not there. But the report was normally is 20 lives are lost there a day, 20 to 25. And uh, 40, none were spared, 40 children just this one day. It's a bloodbath in Augusta. What, what would you think if right now on the news they said 40 people were killed you know, at, at, the, at the shopping center? It'd be a massacre. Massacre in Augusta. They don't even know how to blush. God's, God's saying there's some things, don't even pray for them. I don't think that the abortion thing is the thing he's thinking about here. He's talking about worshiping other gods. But it, the, the culture can be so incensed against God and, and so against God that at some point his hand of grace is removed from a place. And thank God it remains with the saints here. You know, sometimes we don't realize what an important time we are living in in church culture and history. We must stand faithfully for Christ for the sake of any who would live in this generation. That they might know the truth, any of them. God said, I won't even hear them if you pray for them. You know, the demons shudder, and yet some men and women not only provoke God today, they do so repeatedly to the point I fear that even if you prayed for them, God might not hear you on that one. They just, they're just given over to it. A false faith is a dead faith, and it is a fool's faith. Take a look at verse 20. This is 2 sub point A. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? That's James 2.20. Now that word foolish in Koine Greek is kinos, and it has a range of meanings, and none of them are good when it comes to faith. They're all bad. Listen to this when it comes to faith. Vanity. Empty, empty handedness, foolishness. It's all associated with idolatry. Kinos. A foolish person may have a faith, but it will be an idolatrous faith. That is totally a useless faith. It is, as the Lord described Matthew 5:13, salt without saltiness. It's like the stuff out on the road here. It's no good for eating, no good for anything. Herein James turns his attention now from, or to the positive, away from the negative. He's going to give us examples. Two people who are living out their faith, Abraham and Rahab. So let's pick up here. Examples of a living faith. Look at James 2, 21 to 24. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar you see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works, and not by faith alone. Sometimes we read that and we go, wait a minute. Is that true? Well, let's turn to Romans 4 for a minute. We're going to see that verse played out. Here we're going to see something that might look like a conflict set up between Paul and James. Romans 4, 1 to 3. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he's meaning he wasn't, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Well, what does scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him. As righteousness. So what gives is what's happening here? Is there a conflict between Paul and James? I suppose if we're going to cherry pick and just go to James 2.24 and read that, with no context given, there may seem to be some surface level conflict between the two. But hasn't James made it clear right in that area, even if you look at verse 22, he said, you see that faith was active along with the works. That they were working together. And faith was completed by the works. There was an active faith and a completed faith through the works of Abraham. Abraham wasn't saved because of his works. Abraham obeyed because of his faith. Now consider the magnitude of what has occurred in this man Abraham's life. A pagan man from the land of Ur, and God called him and set him apart. Nothing in the man caused God to do this. He possessed no special qualities except God called Abram. 
in Genesis chapter 12. God did all this through the counsel of his own will. And we later learn that it's not the physical seed of Abraham, we have the promise of the seed, but it's the spiritual seed of Abraham that are the believers, not the physical. The ones who would believe in Messiah. Well, if Abraham represents at one end our father of faith, and what we're to look to, what should we think of Rahab at the other spectrum at the end of faith? Maybe, maybe he would be the greatest of faith and she would be the lowliest of faith, Rahab the prostitute. But James is saying, look to her as well. Look to Abraham and look to Rahab the prostitute because they lived out their faith. Was there anything in her that caused God to go, okay, now she's right, now that's, that's my girl right there. Now, now, okay. No. God had already done what he was doing in her. A work moving in the very soul and heart of a woman. And what did it do? It caused her to take action. This is why James was reminding the Jewish converts of Abraham and Rahab. Let's finish with verses 25 and 26. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Rahab believed God. I don't know how much time she had to wonder about it. But I knew this, the whole, the whole place dreaded the Hebrew people coming and their God. And she believed God. So she believed God and she acted upon that belief and showed them, these messengers, the way of escape. Her works were not her salvation. Her saving grace was God. And because of it, she acted in faith and did a good work. And I say, praise the Lord. Well, let's talk about application of such a passage. If we consider James's use of these words, dead, useless, dead. This is necros. Necromancy, talking to the dead. Necros. Dead, arge, necros, arge, necros. Dead, useless, dead. If we take a cue from James and we just simply flip this around from dead, useless, dead. Let us live a useful and living faith. Living useful lives in faith. Don't have a dead, useless, dead faith. Live a useful life in faith. This is our only application today. We're going to look at it from several views. It's the only thing. Let, let your life in faith be living and useful unto the Lord all the time. No spiritually dead person can do this. You have to first be made alive. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5 puts it into perspective for us. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were, here it is, dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Now in this passage we see the spiritually dead brought to life by God's grace through the work of Christ. Yet Jesus taught that us being made alive was intended to have a specific effect in us. He said in John 10, 10, here's the effect. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Ephesians 2, 8 and 10 again, we've been here. We can see what the intended effect is. He said, you're, you're saved by grace through faith, not of your own doing, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. He said, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for the good works which God prepared beforehand. Something about our abundant life, being saved to Christ, has much to do with our good works as we live in this life. Our good works flow from an abundant life in Christ, and all who are saved have been given life, abundant. And if we are such a person, then let us live useful lives of faith. Let us be the doers of the word. Your life in Christ will include many good works. And you might wonder, well, how often should I be doing good works? I would say every day. You should be doing good works every day. There's certainly opportunity to do good works every day. The Apostle Paul taught us in Galatians 6, 9, and 10, And let us never grow weary of doing good, 
For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. Everyone. And especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now, I do believe James gave us an example in verse 15. He said, it, he said, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food. So in the apostles' mind, there's a daily need that we could be meeting. And I don't think we can hinge this whole thing of daily good works on just that verse. I wouldn't build it on that. But as we consider our application, perhaps every day there are things that we can and actually do. We might not be thinking about it. Just you coming here today is a good work to encourage your brothers and sisters in Christ. What might our good works look like? We could write out a really long list. Um, and we, you, you might do that if you'd like to. I would suggest that we could look at four areas that we might have influence in. Well, three that we do and one that we engage in. Your home. Good works in your home are important. Good works in the name of Jesus are important. Good works here in the ecclesia, the church, in your church family are very important. Good works at the place where you work is important. It just depends how you do it. Good works in the public when you go out to the market, wherever you might go, vacation or wherever. God may give you the opportunity for work. So somewhere, as we look at just a few examples, perhaps you could put it in one of those four buckets. You know, maybe you could come up with more. At home, we're to pray for one another and are to be helpful and kind, especially children. I wish for the children to pay attention to this. We're to serve one another. Children are to seek to be helpful to their parents. How about that? Parents, you can thank me later. I don't think the kids are there like 20 minutes ago. You were done with you. Children are to obey their parents, but parents are to love and lead their children and give them the example of what this is like to live and do good works in the home, to be kind and helpful to one another. Okay? In the church family context, we should ask ourselves, how can I best serve this congregation? How can I do that? We pray about it. How can I serve my family of faith? We pray about it. We take action. Some say, well, that my answer to that is I prepare for music. I, I get myself ready to do music. Others are, uh, I prepare reading. Others say, I'm preparing a, a, a dish to share with my brothers and sisters. Some of you are doing combinations. Some of you will serve others through cleaning, um, showing up early, staying later. You know, These are good works. Some of you will lead classes. Some of you will lead in evangelisms. At work, we ought to be wise as we seek to do good works there. It's okay to do good works at work. But you better be careful where you're at, because your boss just might not be okay with you being the little, you know, bio. like if you go, boss, I just need a little half hour of your paid time to witness Jesus to the people here, okay? Your boss might have an issue with that. If you're a paid auto mechanic and you desire to witness for Jesus, it's probably best to save it for your break time and after hours. But you know what you could do? Be a really good auto mechanic and do a great job for your boss because your boss will go, that, that, something different about that guy. That's a hard worker. And when you witness Christ, it'll be a good work. So in a general sense, though, if you think about it, we could do things like visit people who are sick. We could meet the needs of the poor and destitute. These are things that we know we can do. These are good works. But let it be done in Jesus' name when you do it. When you bless... Bless somebody in Jesus' name. Don't be afraid to say, the Lord Jesus Christ blesses you today. When you, if you filled someone's gas tank up. Don't be afraid to say that. If you visit those in prison, those who are ill, do it in Jesus' name. I come to visit you, brother, in Jesus' name. When you serve others or you open your home for hospitality, as many of you do, do it in Jesus' name. It's wonderful. Love your neighbors and help them as often as God gives you the opportunity. A man recently called me. He said, Paul, I'm praying for Donna every day, and I believe he is. He said, what can I do? I said, come and visit sometime, brother. Come and visit. Very practical, right? <laughs> Others, do you need help? Can we pick you something up? Can pick up something for you? These are good works. You do them unto Christ. Finally, as we go out into the public, wherever, whenever opportunity arises as you go in public, if God gives you the opportunity to bless, then bless in Jesus' name. 
If he gives you the opportunity to preach, then preach in Jesus' name. To exhort and encourage, then do so in Jesus' name. Let us be the doers of the word, walking in good works, and so showing our faith to be living, useful, and fully alive in Christ Jesus. Let's pray, church.